Hey, did you have anything else to say? I'm just using mine because mine has a better camera. Okay. Hello, hello, are we ready to go? Oh, that was the signal. She gives the signals like this. My lights are on. Kick us off, Jacob! <laughs> blessed uh, through your name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I ask that as we are here this evening, we will be blessed in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would anoint me, anoint me with the Spirit, that I might preach in the Spirit, anoint us as we sing, anoint this equipment so that it does what it's supposed to do, Lord, and I pray that you would be glorified in everything that we do here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, welcome to Cross Trail Church. It seems like my microphone is, is uh, kind of going in and out there. We'll work with it. Uh, it's okay for now. Back and forth, back and forth. We're glad you're here with us this evening uh, on the internet, through the YouTube channel, on Facebook, and we're also glad that you're here with us. We have a few folks scattered throughout the auditorium here. Uh, <clears throat> just a few announcements. Jake, would you hand me those three books right there? I uh, just uh, want to remind you folks that uh, I am an author. I have written books, and they are published through Amazon. There is The Code of the West in the Bible, if you're um, into the Old West as much as I am. This is a book I read, I wrote uh, that has to do with how living the Code of the West is actually living a biblical life. Then there's Designed to Succeed. This book I wrote, uh, if you, God has designed you to fulfill uh, His will in your life, and if you're living according to God's will for your life, you will succeed. It's a very good book. It's very informative, and you'll find it... Uh, uh, encouraging, and then we have the presence of God, and this is things that you can do in your life that will help you to see more a more active uh, presence of God in your life. He's already active in your life, and this will just help you to see more of it. So these three books are, are available on Amazon. Now listen, the, the um, Design to Succeed and The Presence of God, they are available on Kindle for 99 cents. 99 cents, what a bargain, right? Right there, 99 cents. And then they come to the West in the Bible. It is available on Amazon for four dollars and ninety nine cents. You can, um, and then you can order the paperback off of Amazon. Uh, the Presence of God is eight ninety nine, and um, the Code of the West in the Bible is nine ninety nine, and Designed to Succeed is nine ninety nine. Or you can order them from us directly. Just uh, drop a mail, a, a note, an email at, um, at Cross Trail Church. Dot gmail or uh, cross trail church at gmail not dot at cross trail church at gmail dot com and then there's um uh, or you can just mail it to us at thirty two twenty five southwest eighty second Oklahoma City Oklahoma seven three one five nine and that's all available on our website which is cross trail church dot business dot something but if you put in there cross trail church dot business it'll take you to the site right so has everybody got that clear as mud right clear as mud Look, just buy the books. Okay, so here we are. I'm kidding. You don't have to buy them if you don't want to, but, you know, we like food, and um, this helps pay for it. So, I've got a copy of two of them. Huh? I've got a copy of two of them. Same book? No. Oh, which one do you not have? I don't have the, this one. Oh, well, grab it. Now you do. Look at that. That's just that easy. You owe me eight bucks. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> 
All right, so uh, that's the announcement there. Also, I want to make announcements that uh, there's some big things coming up uh, for Crossroad Church. We're going to continue to do the internet ministry. We've been looking into buying better equipment. Smartphones are wonderful, but they make cameras that are much better. Uh, we do have some new equipment. Jake got a new guitar to play lead, and uh, Michael will soon have a new bass. We're just upgrading. Um, Aaron does not get a new box. He has a drum kit that he needs to learn how to play. Anyhow, that's the news. Anybody got anything to add? We're, we're quickly losing control of this thing. I want to tell you this story. There were two young, uh, there were two little Oki girls, and they were out in the field one night, and uh, they were looking up at the stars. They were looking at the moon, and one of them says, "The other says, you know, the Johnsons they moved to Tennessee." The other girl says, "Really?" She says, "Yep." She says, "Well, how far is Tennessee?" She says, "I don't know." And the one girl looks at the other and says, what do you think is closer, the moon or Tennessee? And the other girl looks at her and says, well, the moon, of course. And she said, what makes you think that? She goes, duh, can you see Tennessee? <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the next song we were going to do? We have any announcements yet? We prayed? All right. I stand amazed in the presence. And if you know this one, you can sing along with this. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's So just a closer walk, uh, hymn number 607. If you want to sing along, hey, look, this is a public worship service. Worship. Worship the Lord. All right, Jacob. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was this one. Got it? Oh 
I learned 
it's a song I wrote. <clears throat> I like to write songs. And this one uh, actually does go along with the message. Uh, and it's called, It Happened at the Cross. We've done it before. <clears throat> but it's one of the ones that I, I like to do, and it goes with the message. So, uh, go ahead, Jacob. <laughs> chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, and when you find that, if you wouldn't mind standing with me to honor God and His Word this evening, and we'll read the text beginning in verse 17 on through 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. If you wouldn't mind standing with me. First or second? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me say again. He hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Sovereign Lord, thank you for your word. And I just pray for that blessing, that anointing, to be able to deliver your message uh, to the hearts and souls and minds of the people who need to hear it. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Now, how I was inspired here to uh, prepare this message out of 2 Corinthians 
That's kind of easy to explain. I kind of want to tell you the story. Most often when I am inspired, it's when someone asks me to clarify the meaning of a certain text from the Bible. And on Monday, Monday uh, morning, uh, Monday uh, evening. evening, excuse me, a friend from Newkirk called me and he asked about this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, what we read twice where it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> My friend desired to know exactly what that verse meant because he had listened to some other preachers, preachers who went so far as to say things such as Jesus actually became Satan on the cross when he was crucified or that Jesus uh, became sinful while on the cross. And none of these things are correct. As a matter of fact, they're about as far from correct as you could ever get. So I was, in, uh, I was uh, challenged here through that. And we spoke at some length on the phone about this, and I was challenged to rightly divide the word of truth. I was challenged to clearly present what Paul meant when he penned these, this phrase all those years ago. And that's what I intend to do in this message. But before we get to the explanation of this verse, we have to keep everything in context, folks. That's the only way to understand the Bible. You have to keep it in context. And to do that, you have to begin at verse 17. Well, actually, the context begins at the beginning of the chapter because it's here that Paul begins to speak to the Corinthians about what life will be like for believers after Christ's return, after the resurrection, after we received our glorified body, and, uh, and, after we have been, and now that we have been reconciled to Christ. And he sums up everything in verse 17 when he writes, Therefore, if me, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And he's speaking to the reconciling and regenerating work of Jesus Christ. You see, when a person places saving faith in the Lord Jesus, then everything becomes new. Everything in their life becomes new. Old things are passed away. When we are saved, when we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit through the, work, uh, through the work of the cross, through what Jesus did on the cross. Now listen, all things become new. And what that means is that from that point, we don't judge anyone or anything from a worldly standard. Paul states this in verse 16 when he says, Wherefore, henceforth, or since the time that we were reconciled, know, ye, know we no man after the flesh, yet, yea, though... We have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. In other words, everything is changed. This is Paul's way of saying, we don't view anything from a worldly perspective any longer. Now that we are saved, now that we are reconciled, we do not view anything from a worldly perspective. We regard everything. We regard one another from a heavenly perspective from a regenerate perspective, from a reconciled perspective. And what that means is, when a person comes to Christ, when a person comes to Christ, honestly comes to Christ in repentance and faith, every sin, every wrongdoing, every misdeed they may have ever committed in their life is covered by Jesus' blood. And that person, whoever he or she is, becomes a whole new person in the eyes of God. A whole new person in the eyes of God. And that person, any person who comes to Christ, should be viewed as a whole new person in the eyes of the church, in the eyes of other believers. And this means that any past sin that you may have committed is no indicator of how a person should be received or treated in the church. All things have become new. The minute a person walks the aisle and professes faith in Jesus Christ, they become a part of the body of Christ. They become a member of the church universal. And so no one's past should ever be held against them in the church. And this also means that we are reconciled to God, that our sins are covered under the blood. This also means that any sins that you may commit, even after coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they are also past tense in the eyes of God. They are covered by the blood in the eyes of God. Somebody once asked me, does Jesus' blood cover all your sins, even those ones in the future? 
And so I asked him, how many of your sins were in the future when Jesus died on the cross? Every single one of them. So the answer is yes. All our sins. All our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. Past, present, and future. And I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying this evening. This means any sin that you've committed, even after coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, is past tense in the eyes of God. Okay? Even if we fail, even when we fail, because we're all going to fail at some time, after being saved, the very minute that you repent, seek the Lord's forgiveness, then you're forgiven. And those sins are covered by the blood. And this is straight from the Word of God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness and restoration. That should be the order of the day in the church. Forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. That is to be the order of the day among Christians. Unfortunately, you know, this is sometimes not the case in the church. The Lord Jesus is gracious. He is loving. He is very willing to forgive every sin, every shortcoming. But people are sometimes not like Jesus. The people that we live with in this world, they are petty. They hold grudges. They are cruel. It's just a fact of life. It's just a fact of life. And that means that if you make a mistake, if you make a mistake anywhere along the line, uh, uh, as you're living for Jesus, there are going to be some people and they're never going to let you live it down. But here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. That as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, as long as you go to Jesus, you seek forgiveness and restoration, he's going to forgive you. And as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, it doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter if they can let it go or not. You see, we're not here to please people. We're here to please Christ. And what I'm telling you is don't let what other people think trip you up in your walk with the Lord Jesus. You just keep right on walking with Jesus. Don't worry about what those other pe people think. There's going to be people that are never going to let you live a, a mistake down. And I can't tell you why they're like this. I can't because I'm not like this. I don't, you know, if someone makes a mistake, it's on them, it's not on me. But I can forgive them and continue to have a relationship with them. I can't tell you why other people are not like this, but I can speculate. And it's just my opinion, but I suppose that people who tend to focus on other people's failures kind of makes them feel better about themselves and their own failures. People who uh, tend to focus on other people's failures kind of makes them feel superior to others as if, you know, I'm, I'm more loved by God than you are. And don't we just really love to compare ourselves to each other as if this, there's really any merit to it? Don't we just love to do that? Well, you know, I, I'm not perfect and I've made mistakes, but at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so over there. Maybe you are. Maybe you just don't know it. We do love to think of ourselves as better than each other, as if this isn't sinful and foolish in the eyes of God. But it is. But if we are going to live according to God's standard, then forgiveness is the order of the day. Forgiveness is the order of the day. If we're going to live according to God's standard, then we absolutely must seek restoration when we have a falling out. We must absolutely seek to restore anybody who falls away from the church. See, at one time we're all prodigals. We're all prodigals. We are all at one time or another in our life that one sheep who wanders away, whom Jesus leaves the 99 to go and search for. And we ought to live like Jesus. We ought to love like Jesus. If there's someone, if there's someone who is falling away, someone who has uh, drifted away and apart from the church, apart from Christ, then we ought to go to seek reconciliation and restore them in life. We ought to tell them that what they've done doesn't matter. It's covered by the blood. They need to come home. And the point is, in Christ, we are new creations. In Christ, all things are become new. In Christ, we now live according to a whole new dynamic. And all this was accomplished for us by the Lord Jesus through his redemptive work on the cross, through his restorative work, through his resurrection. It's all accomplished by the life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit within us. 
We become a whole new creation through the work of regeneration. And I like what Matthew Henry says about it. He says, regenerating grace creates a whole new world in the soul. All things are new. The renewed man acts from new principles, by new rules, with new ends, and in new company. And then, as we continue through the rest of the chapter, we find Paul now writing about the reconciling work of Christ, verses 18 and 19. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Uh, so this is Paul speaking to reconciliation. And what we really need, uh, the question we need answered is this, is what does it mean to be reconciled? You know, a firm understanding of reconciliation will help us to know exactly what God accomplished when he sent his only begotten son to die in our place on the cross. And so the, the, the very short answer to what, do, what does it mean to be reconciled is just this. To be reconciled means that our relationship to our Father God, our relationship to our Creator, has been restored through the Son, through Jesus our Messiah, in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is, that's a pretty standard definition of reconciliation. Our relationship to God has been restored. But there's always a place for gaining a deeper understanding of spiritual things. And I really hope that you desire to have a deeper understanding of reconciliation or the spiritual nature of reconciliation. Because that's just exactly where we're going to go. I'm never content to just leave something alone at the surface definition. And so what I did was I went to Webster's Dictionary and looked up the word reconciliation. And it had several different definition, definitions. And every one of the definitions that Webster's gave has a bearing on our understanding of our reconciled nature with God. Every one of the definitions that, that Webster's gave about reconciliation is significant to our understanding of what was accomplished through Jesus on the cross. Definition number one from Webster's definition of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a restoration of friendly relations. A restoration of friendly relations. The implication from this is that before we are reconciled to God, we're not on friendly terms with Him. We're not. Uh, that's something that we don't really comprehend until after we are saved and the Holy Spirit then exposes our sinful nature to us. Most lost people don't understand the enmity and the animosity that they hold toward God, but it does exist. They just can't see it. I mean, believers can see it. Believers can see the hostility in the world towards God, towards Christians, towards Christ, towards the church. But unbelievers, they can't see it 